the best Spanish cyclist in history at the last dance, the Vuelta a España of redemption after his cruel surrender in Lezar. Do you want to know what happened during the 1996 Vuelta a España? Follow my wheel and I'll tell you. The relationship between the Vuelta a España and the five-time tour champion was never what Spanish fans would have wanted. We met in Durain when that huge boy with tangled hair came to lead the 1985 Vuelta a España, months before his 21st birthday, being at that time the youngest leader in the history of the competition. He was a fixture of the race until 1991, but always accompanied by mishaps that didn't let him perform at his highest level. Bronchitis, falls, fractures, there was no way for the Navarrese to complete a Vuelta in conditions, although in July, he already began to enter the top positions of the tour, always as Pedro Delgado's domestique. In 1991, the year of his great takeoff in France, it seemed that Indurain's first great victory was finally going to come during the dispute of the Vuelta a España, at that time in spring. However, the victory went to Melchor Mari, who made the race of his life and was even able to overcome Banesto's cyclist in his own specialty, the time trial. There ended the relationship between Indurain and the great race for stages of his country. After Miguel Indurain's run of five successive Tour de France wins had been ended in July of 1996 by Bjorn Rees, the management of the Spaniards' Banesto team endeavored to convince Indurain to take part in that September's Vuelta. Indurain had not participated in his national tour since finishing second in 1991 and initially rebuffed the idea. But lifted by his Olympic time trial success in Atlanta, in the wake of his dismal 11th place finish at the tour, Indurain eventually agreed to line up at the start in Valencia. He began well. When Once decimated the prospects of several contenders on the win hit third stage to Albacete, Indurain was wise to their ruse and infiltrated the lead group. Third place on the technical mid-race time trial to Avila pushed him up to second overall behind Once's Alex Zul. However, when two days later, Once raised the pace on the short but steep climb of the Alto de Naranco, Indurain slipped back just as he had at Les Arcs two months earlier. At the beginning of the climb, Indurain resisted in a group of 10 that Zarabaitia pulled and that included three other teammates, especially Jalaber and Zul, who launched an attack two kilometers from the finish. Not too hard, but enough to leave Indurain suffering as in his last tour, trying, unsuccessfully, to follow the wheel of his partner, Shaba Jimenez. Indurain was writhing as he had twisted in July, and ahead, Jalaber and Zul were flying, arriving more than a minute apart in just 2,000 meters. Although he only dropped to third overall, next up was the key mountain stage to Lagos de Covadonga. Press, fans, everyone expected a miraculous recovery of the giant Miguelon, the extraterrestrial, the one who had given us so many afternoons of glory the last five years. Faith was blind. Everything was prepared for the resurgence of the great hero. However, that afternoon, appointed for glory, became, for the myth of Spanish cycling, the last dance. Before Lagos, the riders tackled the first category, Fito Pass. When Tony Rominger attacked, provoking a response from race leader Zul and his Onsa team, Indurain drifted backwards once again. The TV cameras tracking his every pedal stroke. His rhythm wasn't that of someone going through a bad time, but that of someone who wanted to disappear and do it as soon as possible. The world of cycling contemplated astonished, the fall of the most important cyclist of the 90s. For a while, Marino Alonso stayed with his team leader, until Indurain urged him to press on, insisting he couldn't follow. More than four minutes in arrears as he crossed the Fito, Indurain descended the pass with his former teammate, Herminio Diaz Zabala, who tried to encourage him. But down in the valley, soon after the Grubetto had written up to him and after consulting his stage map several times, Indurain pulled over to the right-hand side of the road and stopped before crossing the road and heading straight into the lobby of the Hotel El Capitan, Banesto's home for the night. A statement from team doctor Sabino Padilla said that Indurain had been affected by sinusitis and bronchitis, while the writer himself later admitted he simply expended his physical resources and had nothing left to give. The Vuelta had been a race too far. 
At that point, there was little suggestion that Indurain would retire, but it quickly became apparent that the rancor he felt towards Banesto's management had resulted in the breakdown of their relationship. For a few weeks, it appeared that Indurain might be tempted into a move to arch-rivals Once, but Once boss Manolo Saiz was unable to pull off that incredible coup. After many rumors and speculations about his possible change of team and his future plans, on January 2, 1997, Indurain called a press conference. It could only be to announce his retirement because it was too late to sign for any team. He claimed to be physically fit to win a sixth tour, but not mentally fit to prepare for it. In this way, somewhat cruel, we said goodbye to the best Spanish rider in the history of cycling, who made us live the sport of two wheels with an overflowing passion during those unforgettable months of July in the 1990s. Thank you very much for getting here. If you liked the video, subscribe and click like. You can collaborate with us, activating a super thanks. And if you want to continue enjoying the best moments of Miguel Indurain, don't miss this.